An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott Chapter 10 Brothers and Sisters Polly's happiest day was a Sunday, for Will never failed to spend it with her. Instead of sleeping later than usual that morning, she was always up bright and early, flying round to get ready for her guest, for Will came to breakfast, and they made a long day of it. Will considered his sister the best and prettiest girl going, and Polly, knowing well that the time would come, when he would find a better and a prettier, was grateful for his good opinion, and tried to deserve it. So she made her room and herself as neat and inviting as possible, and always ran to meet him with a bright face and a motherly greeting, when he came tramping in, ruddy, brisk and beaming, with the brown loaf and the little pot of beans from the bakehouse nearby. They liked a good country breakfast, and nothing gave Polly more satisfaction than to see her big boy clear the dishes, empty the little coffee pot, and then sit and laugh at her across the ravaged table. Another pleasure was to let him help clear away, as they used to do at home, while the piece of laughter that always accompanied this performance did Miss Mill's heart good to hear, for the room was so small and Will so big that he seemed to be everywhere at once, and Polly and Pattel were continually dodging his long arms and legs. Then they used to inspect the flower pots, pay Nick a visit, and have a little music as a good beginning for the day, after which they went to church and dined with Miss Mills, who considered Will an excellent young man. If the afternoon was fair, they took a long walk together over the bridges into the country, or about the city streets full of Sabbath quietude. Most people meeting them would have seen only an awkward young man, with the boy's face atop of his tall body, and a quietly dressed, fresh-faced little woman hanging on his arm. But a few people, with eyes to read romances and pleasant histories everywhere, found something very attractive in this couple, and smiled as they passed, wondering if they were young, lovers, or country cousins looking around. If the day was stormy, they stayed at home, reading, writing letters, talking over their affairs, and giving each other good advice. For, though Will was nearly three years younger than Polly, he couldn't, for the life of him, help assuming amusingly venerable airs, when he became a freshman. In the twilight he had a good lounge on the sofa, and Polly sang to him, which arrangement he particularly enjoyed. It was so cozy and homey. At nine o'clock Polly packed his bag with clean clothes, nicely mended, such remnants of the festive tea as were transportable, and kissed him good night with many injunction to muffle up his throat going over the bridge, and be sure that his feet were dry and warm when he went to bed. All of which Will laughed at, accepted graciously, and didn't obey. But he liked it, and trudged away for another week's work, rested, cheered, and strengthened by that quiet, happy day with Polly, for he had been brought up to believe in home influences, and his brother and sister loved one another dearly, and were not ashamed to own it. One other person enjoyed the humble pleasures of this Sunday quite as much as Polly and Will. Maud used to beg to come to tea, and Polly, glad to do anything for those who had done a good deal for her, made a point of calling for the little girl as they came home from their walk, or sending Will to escort her in the carriage, which Maud always managed to secure if bad weather threatened to quench her hopes. Tom and Fanny laughed at her fancy, but she did not tire of it for the child was lonely and found something in that little room which the great house could not give her. Maud was twelve now, a pale, plain child with sharp, intelligent eyes and a busy little mind that did a good deal more thinking than anybody imagined. She was just at the unattractive, fidgety age when no one knew what to do with her and so let her fumble her way up as she could, finding pleasure in odd things and leaving much alone, for she did not go to school, because her shoulders were growing round, and Mrs. Shaw would not allow her figure to be spoiled. That suited Maud excellently, and whenever her father spoke of sending her again, or getting a governess, she was seized with bad headaches, a pain in her back, or weakness of the eyes, at which Mr. Shaw laughed, but let her holiday go on. Nobody seemed to care much for plain, pug-nosed little Maudy. Her father was busy, her mother nervous and sick, Fanny absorbed in her own affairs, and Tom regarded her as most young men do their younger sisters, as a person born for his amusement and convenience, nothing more. 
Maud admired Tom with all her art, and made a little slave of herself to him, feeling well repaired if he merely said, Thank you, chicken, or didn't pinch her nose, or nip her ear, as he had a way of doing, just as if I was a doll or a dog and hadn't got any feelings, she sometimes said to Fanny, when some service or sacrifice had been accepted without gratitude or respect. It never occurred to Tom, when Maud sat watching him with her face full of wistfulness, that she wanted to be petted as much as ever he did in his neglected boyhood, or that when he called her pug before people, her little feelings were as deeply wounded as he is used to be, when the boys called him carrots. He was fond of her in her fashion, but he didn't take the trouble to show it, so Maud worshipped him far off, afraid to betray the affection that no rebuff could kill or cool. One snowy Sunday afternoon, Tom lay on the sofa in his favorite attitude, reading Pendennis for the fourth time, and smoking like a chimney as he did so. Maud stood at the window watching the falling flakes with an anxious countenance, and presently a great sigh broke from her. Ah, <sighs> don't do that again, chicken, or you'll blow me away. What's the matter? asked Tom, throwing down his book with a yawn that threatened dislocation. I'm afraid I can't go to Polly's, answered Maud disconsolately. Of course you can't. It's snowing hard, and father won't be home with the carriage till this evening. What are you always cutting off to Polly's for? I like it. We have such nice times, and Will is there, and we bake little Johnny cakes in the baker before the fire, and they sing, and it is so pleasant. Warbling Johnny cakes must be interesting. Come and tell me all about it. No, you will only laugh at me. I give you my word I won't, if I can help it, but I am really dying of curiosity to know what you do down there. You like to hear secrets, so tell me yours, and I'll be as dumb as an oyster. It isn't a secret, and you wouldn't care for it. Do you want another pillow? She added, as Tom gave his a thump. This will do, but why you women always stick tassels and fringe all over a sofa cushion to tease and tickle a fellow is what I don't understand. One thing that Polly does Sunday nights is to take Will's head in her lap and smooth his forehead. It thrusts him after studying so hard, she says. If you don't like the pillow, I could do that for you, cause you look as if you were more tired of studying than Will said Maud with some hesitation, but an evident desire to be useful and agreeable. Well, I don't care if you do try it, for I am confoundedly tired. And Tom laughed, as he recalled the frolic he had been on the night before. Maud established herself with great satisfaction, and Tom owned that a silk apron was nicer than a fuzzy cushion. Do you like it? she asked, after a few strokes over the odd forehead, which she thought was fevered by intense application to Greek and Latin. Not bad, play away, was the gracious reply, as Tom shut his eyes and lay so still that Maud was charmed at the success of her attempt. Presently she said softly, Tom, are you asleep? Just turning the corner. Before you get quite round, would you please tell me what a public admonition is? What do you want to know for? demanded Tom, opening his eyes very wide. I heard Will talking about publics and privates, and I meant to ask him, but I forgot. What did he say? I don't remember. It was about somebody who cut prayers and got a private, and had done all sorts of bad things, and had one or two publics. I didn't hear the name and didn't care. I only wanted to know what the words meant. So Will tells tales, does he? And Tom's forehead wrinkled with a frown. No, he didn't. Polly knew about it and asked him. Will's a dig, growled Tom, shutting his eyes again, as if nothing more could be said of the delinquent William. I don't care if he is. I like him very much, and so does Polly. Happy fresh, said Tom with a comical groan. You needn't sniff at him, for he is nice and treats me with respect, cried Maud, with an energy that made Tom laugh in her face. He is good to Polly always, and puts on her cloak for her, and says, my dear, and kisses her good night and don't think it silly, and I wish I had a brother just like him. Yes, I do. And Maud showed signs of woe, for her disappointment about going was very great. Bless my boots, what's the chicken ruffling up her little feathers and pecking at me for? Is that the way Polly soothes the best of brothers? said Tom, still laughing. 
oh i forgot there i won't cry but i want to go and maud swallowed her tears and began to stroke again now tom's horse and sleigh were in the stable for he meant to drive out to college that evening but he didn't take maud's hint it was less trouble to lie still and say in a conciliatory tone tell me some more about this good boy it's very interesting no i shan't but i'll tell you about Patel's playing on the piano said maud anxious to efface the memory of her momentary weakness polly points to the right key with a little stick and Patel sits on the stool and pets each key as it's touched and makes a tune it is so funny to see her and nick perches on the rack and sings as if he'd kill himself very thrilling said tom in a sleepy tone maud felt that her conversation was not as interesting as she hoped and tried again polly thinks that you are handsomer than mr sidney much obliged i asked the which she thought had the nicest face and she said yours was the handsomest and his the best does he ever go there asked the sharp voice behind them and looking round maud so funny in the big chair cooking her feet over the register i never saw him there he sent some books one day and will teased her about it what did she do demanded fanny oh she shook him what a spectacle and tom looked as if he would have enjoyed seeing it but fanny's face grew so forbidding that tom little's dog who was approaching to welcome her put his tail between his legs and flew under the table then there isn't any sparkling sunday night sang tom who appeared to have waked up again of course not paul isn't going to marry anybody she's going to keep house for will when he is a minister i heard her say so cried maud with importance what a fate for pretty polly ejaculated tom she likes it and i'm sure i should think she would it's beautiful to hear and plain it all out any more gossip to retail pug asked tom a minute after as maud seemed absorbed in visions of the future he told the funny story about blowing up one of the professors you never told us so i suppose you didn't know it some bad fellow put a torpedo or some sort of powder thing under the chair and it went off in the midst of the lesson and the poor man flew up frightened most to pieces and the boys ran with pails of water to put the fire out but the thing that made will laugh most was that the very fellow who did it got his trouser burnt trying to put out the fire and he asked the is it faculty or president either will do murmured tom who was shaking with suppressed laughter well he asked them to give him some new ones and they did give him money enough for a nice pair but he got some cheap ones with horrid great stripes on them and always wore them to that particular class which was one too many for the fellows will said and with the rest of the money he had a punch party wasn't it dreadful awful and tom exploded into a great laugh that made fanny cover her ears and the little dog bark quietly did you know the bad boy asked the innocent maud slightly gasped tom in whose wardrobe at college those identical trousers were hanging at that moment don't make such a noise my head aches dreadfully said fanny fretfully girls said always do ache answered tom subsiding from a roar into a chuckle what pleasure you boys can find in such ungentlemanly things i don't see said fanny who was evidently out of sorts as much a mystery to you as it is to us how you girls can lie to gabble and bring from one week's end to the other retorted tom there was a pause after this little passage at arms but fan wanted to be amused for time hung heavily on her hands so she asked in a more amiable tone how is trix as sweet as ever answered tom gruffly did she scold you as usual she just did what was the matter well i leave it to you if this isn't unreasonable she won't dance with me herself yet don't like me to go out with anybody else i said i thought if a fellow took a girl to a party she ought to dance with him once at least especially if they were engaged she said that was the very reason why she shouldn't do it so at the last hop i let her alone and had gay time with belle and to-day trix gave it to me hot and heavy coming home from the church if you go and engage yourself to a girl like that i don't know what you can expect 
Did she wear her Paris hat today? added Fan with sudden interest in her voice. She wore some sort of a blue thing with a confounded bird of paradise in it that kept whisking to my face every time she turned her head. Men never know a pretty thing when they see it. That head is perfectly lovely. They know a lady when they see her, and tricks don't look like one. I can't say where the trouble is, but there is too much fuss and feathers for my taste. You are twice as stylish, yet you never look loud or fast. Touched by this unusual compliment, Fanny drew her chair near as she replied with complacency. Yes, I flatter myself I do know how to dress well. Trix never did. She's fond of gay colors and generally looks like a walking rainbow. Can't you give her a hint? Tell her not to wear blue gloves anyway. She knows I hate them. I've done my best for your sake, Tom, but she's a perverse creature. And don't mind the word I say, even about things much more objectionable than blue gloves. Maudie, run and bring me my other cigar case. It's lying around somewhere. Maud went, and as soon as the door was shut, Tom rose on his elbow, saying in a cautiously lowered voice, Fun, does tricks paint? Oh, yes, and draws too, answered Fanny with a sly laugh. Come, you know what I mean. I have right to ask, and you ought to tell, said Tom soberly, for he was beginning to find that being engaged was not a mitigated bliss. What makes you think she does? Well, between ourselves, said Tom, looking a little sheepish, but anxious to set his mind at rest, she never will let me kiss her on her cheek. Nothing but an unsatisfactory peck at her lips. Then, the other day, as I took a bit of heliotrope out of a vase to put in my buttonhole, I whisked a drop of water into her face. I was going to wipe it off, but she pushed my hand away and ran to the glass, where she carefully dabbed it dry, and came back with one cheek rather than the other. I didn't say anything, but I had my suspicions. Come now, does she? Yes, she does. But don't say a word to her, for she'll never forgive my telling if she knew it. I don't care for that. I don't like it and won't have it, said Tom decidedly. You can't help yourself. Half the girls do it. Other paint or powder, darken their lashes with burnt hair pins, or take colonial lumps of sugar or belladonna to make their eyes bright. Clara tried arsenic for her complexion, but her mother stopped it said Fanny, betraying the secrets of the prison house in the basest manner. I knew your girls were a set of humbugs, and very pretty ones to some of you, but I can say I like to see you painted up like a lot of actresses, said Tom with an air of disgust. I don't do anything of the sort, or need it, but Trix does, and having chosen her, you must abide your choice, for better or worse. It hasn't come to that yet, muttered Tom, as he lay down again with a rebellious air. Maud's return put an end to these confidences, though Tom excited her curiosity by asking the mysterious question, I say, Fan, is Polly up to that sort of things? No, she thinks it's awful. When she gets pale and dragged out, she will probably change her mind. I doubt it, said Tom. Polly says it isn't proper to talk secrets before people who ain't in them, observed Maud with dignity. Do, for mercy's sake, stop talking about Paul. I'm sick to death of it, cried Fanny snappishly. Hello, oh, Tom said up to take a survey. I thought you were bosom friends and as puny as ever. Well, I am fond of Polly, but I get tired of hearing Maud sing her praises everlastingly. Now don't go and repeat that chatterbox. My goodness, isn't she cross, whispered Maud to Tom. As two sticks, let her be. There's a bell, see who it is, Pug, answered Tom, as a tingle broke the silence of the house. Maud went to peep over the banisters and came flying back in a rapture. It's will come for me, can't I go? It don't snow hard and I'll bundle up, and you can send for me when Papa comes. I don't care what you do, answered Fan, who was in a very bad temper. Without waiting for any other permission, Maud rushed away to get ready. Will won't come up. He was so snowy, and Fanny was glad, because with her he was bashful, awkward, and silent. So Tom went down and entertained him with Maud's report. They were very good friends, but led entirely different lives, Will being a dick and Tom's a bird, or in plain English, one was a hard student and the other a jolly young gentleman. Tom had rather patronized Will, 
who didn't like it and showed that he didn't by refusing to borrow money of him or accept any of his invitation to join the clubs and societies to which Tom belonged. So Shaw let Milton alone, and he got on very well in his own way, doggedly sticking to his boots and resisting all temptation but those of certain libraries, athletic games, and such an expensive pleasures as were within his means. For this benighted youth had not yet discovered that college nowadays is a place in which to skylark, not to study. When Maud came down and trotted contentedly away, holding Will's hand, Tom watched them out of sight, and then strolled about the house whistling and thinking, till he went to sleep in his father's summer chair, for want of something better to do. He awoke to the joys of a solitary tea, for his mother never came down, and Fanny shut herself and her headache up in her own room. Well, this is cheerful, he said, as the clock struck eight, and his fourth cigar came to an end. Trix is mad, and fun in the dance, so I'll take myself off. I guess I'll go round to Polly's and test Quill to drive out with me and save him the walk, poor chap. Might bring Midgets home, it will please her, and there is no knowing when the governor will be back. With these thoughts in his head, Tom leisurely got under way, and left his horse at a neighboring stable, for he meant to make a little call, and see what it was the Maud enjoyed so much. Polly's holding forth, he said to himself, as he went quietly upstairs, and the steady murmur of a pleasant voice came down to him. Tom laughed at Polly's earnest way of talking when she was interested in anything, but he liked it because it was so different from the coquettish clatter of most of the girls with whom he talked. Young men often laughed at the sensible girls whom they secretly respect, and affect to admire the silly ones whom they secretly despise, because earnestness, intelligence, and womanly dignity are not the fashion. The door was ajar, and pausing in the dark entry, Tom took a survey before he went in. The prospect was not dazzling, but homelike and pleasant. The light of a bright fire filled the little room, and down on a stool before it was Maud attending Battle, and watching with deep interest the roasting of an apple intended for her special benefit. On the couch lounged Will, his thoughtful eyes fixed on Polly, who, while she talked, smoothed the broad forehead of her yellow-haired lady in a way that Tom thought an immense improvement on Maud's performance. They had evidently been building castles in the air, for Polly was saying in her most impressive manner, Well, whatever you do, Will, don't have a great costly church that takes so much money to build and support it that you have nothing to give away. I like the plain, old-fashioned churches, built for use, not show, where people meet for hearty praying and preaching, and where everybody made their own music instead of listening to opera singers, as we do now. I don't care if the old churches were bare and cold, and the seats hard. There was real piety in them, and the sincerity of it was felt in the lives of the people. I don't want a religion that I put away with my Sunday clothes, and don't take out till the days come round again. I want something to see and feel and live by day by day, and I hope you'll be the one of the true minister who can teach by precept and example how to get and keep it. I hope I shall be, Polly, but you know they say that in families, if there is a boy who can do anything else, they make a minister of him. I sometimes think I ain't good for much, and that seems to me the reason why I shouldn't even try to be a minister, said Will, smiling yet looking as if with all his humility he did have faith in the aspirations that came to him in his best moments. Someone said that very thing to father once, and I remember he answered, I am glad to give my best and brightest son to the service of God. Did he say that? And Will scholars rose, for the big, book-loving fellow was as sensitive as a girl to the praise of those dearest to him. Yes, said Polly, unconsciously giving the strongest stimulus to her brother's hope and courage. Yes, and he added, I shall let my boys follow the guide that is in them, and only ask of them to use their gifts consciously, and be honest, useful men. So we will. Ned is doing well out west, and I'm hard at it here. If father does his best to give us the chance we each want, the least we can do is to work with a will. Whatever you do, you can help walking with a wheel, cried Tom, who had been so interested that he forgot he was playing eavesdropper. 
Polly flew up, looking so pleased and surprised, that Tom reproached himself for not having called oftener. I've come for Maud, he announced in a paternal tone, which made the young lady open her eyes. I can go till my apple is done, besides it isn't nine yet, and Will is going to take me along when he goes. I'd rather have him. I'm going to take you both in the cutter. The storm is over, but it is heavy walking. So you'll drive out with me, old man, said Tom with a nod at Will. Of course he will, and thank you very much. I've been trying to keep him all night. Miss Mill always manages to find a corner for stray people, but he insists on going, so as to get to work early tomorrow said Polly, delighted to see that Tom was taking off his coat, as if he meant to wait for Maud's apple, which Polly blessed for being so slow to cook. Putting her guest into the best chair, Polly sat down and beamed at him with such hospitable satisfaction that Tom went up several pegs in his own estimation. You don't come very often, so we are rather overpowered when you do honor us, she said demurely. Well, you know, we fellows are so busy, we haven't much time to enjoy ourselves, answered Tom. Ahem, <coughs> said Will loudly. Take the trosh, said Tom. Then they both burst out laughing, and Polly, fully understanding the joke, joined them, saying, Here are some peanuts, Tom. Do enjoy yourself while you can. Now I call that a delicate compliment, and Tom, who had not lost his early relish for this sort of refreshment, though he seldom indulged his passion nowadays, because peanuts are considered vulgar, fell to cracking and munching with great satisfaction. Do you remember the first visit I made at your house, how you gave me peanuts coming from the depot and frightened me out of my wits, pretending the coachman was tipsy? asked Polly. Of course I do. And how we coasted one day, answered Tom, laughing. Yes, and the velocipede. You've got the scar of that, I see. I remember how you stood by me while it was sewed up. That was very plucky, Polly. I was dreadfully afraid, but I remember I wanted to seem very brave, because you'd called me a coward. Did I? Ought to have been ashamed of myself. I used to rough too shamefully, Polly, and you were so good-natured, you let me do it. Couldn't help myself laughed Polly. I used to think you were an awful boy, but seems to me I rather liked it. She had so much of it at home, she got used to it, put in Will, pulling the little curl behind Polly's ear. You boys never teased me as Tom did. That's the reason it amused me, I suppose. Novelty has charms, you know. Grandma used to lecture Tom for plaguing you, Polly, and he used to say it'd be a tip-top boy, but he wasn't, observed Maud with a venerable air. Dear old grandma, she did her best, but I am a bad lot, said Tom, with a shake of the head and a sober face. It always seems as if she must be up in her rooms, and I can't get used to finding them empty, added Polly softly. Father wouldn't have anything moved, and Tom sits up there sometimes. He makes him feel good, he says, said Maud, who had a talent for betraying trifles which people preferred should not be mentioned in public. You'd better hurry up your apple, for if it isn't done pretty soon, you'll have to leave it, Pug, said Tom, looking annoyed. How is fun? asked Polly with tact. Well, fun is rather under the weather. Says she's distracted, which means cross. She is cross, but she is sick too, for I found her crying one day, and she said nobody cared about her, and she might as well be dead, added Maud, having turned her apple with tender care. We must try to cheer her up among us. If I wasn't so busy, I'd like to devote myself to her. She has done so much for me, said Polly gratefully. I wish you could. I can't understand her, for she acts like a weathercock, and I never know how I'm going to find her. I hate to have her mope so, but upon my life I don't know what to do, said Tom. But as he uttered the word, something was suggested by the side before him chairs were few when Polly had taken up a wheels when they drew round the fire. Now she was leaning against him in a cosy, confiding way, delightful to behold, while Will's strong arms went round her with a protecting air, which said, as plainly as any words, that his big brother and small sister knew how to love and help one another. It was a pleasant little picture, all the pleasanter for his unconsciousness, and Tom found it both suggestive and agreeable. Poor old Fan, she don't get much petting. Maybe that's what she wants. 
i'll try and see for she stands by me like a trump if she was a rosy cosy little woman like polly it would come easier though thought tom as he meditatively ate his last nut feeling that fraternal affection could not be very difficult of demonstrations to brothers blessed with pretty good-tempered sisters i told tom about the bad fellow who blew up the professor and he said he knew him slightly and i was so relieved because i had a kind of feeling that he was tom himself you and we laughed so about it Maud had a queer way of going out with her own thoughts and suddenly coming out with whatever lay uppermost regardless of time place or company as this remark fell from her there was a general smile and polly said with mock solemnity it was a sad thing and i have no doubt that misguided young man is very sorry for it now he looked perfectly bowed down with remorse last time i saw him said will regarding tom with eyes full of fun for will was a boy as well as a bookworm and relished a joke as well as scattered brain tob he always is remorseful after a scrape i've understood for he isn't a very bad fellow only his spirits are too many for him and he isn't as fond of his book as another fellow i know i'm afraid he'll be expelled if you don't mind said polly warningly shouldn't wonder if he was he's such an unlucky dog answered tom rather soberly i hope he'll remember that his friends will be very much disappointed if he is he might make them so proud and happy that i guess he will for he isn't half as spotless as he makes himself out said polly looking across at tom with such friendly eyes that he was quite touched though of course he didn't show it thank you polly he may pull through but i have my doubts now old man let's pad along it is getting late for the chicken he added relapsing into the graceful diction with which a classical education gifts his fortunate possessor taking advantage of the moment while will was wrestling with his boots in the closet and maud was absorbed in packing her apple into a large basket polly said to tom in a low tone thank you very much for being so kind to will bless your heart i haven't done anything he's such a proud fellow he won't let me answered tom but you do in many little ways to-night for example do you think i don't know that the suit of clothes he's just got would have cost a good deal more if your tailor hadn't made them he's only a boy and don't understand things yet but i know your way of helping proud people so that they don't find out and i do thank you tom so much oh come polly that won't do what do you know about tailors and college matters said tom looking as much confused as if she had found him out in something reprehensible i don't know much and that's the reason why i'm grateful for your kindness to will i don't care what stories they tell about you i'm sure you won't lead him into trouble but keep him straight for my sake you know i have lost one brother and will takes jimmy's place to me now the tears in polly's eyes as she said that made tom vow a tremendous vow within himself to stand by will through thick and thin and keep him straight for polly's sake feeling all the time how ill-fitted he was for such a task i'll do my best he said heartily as he pressed the hand polly gave him with a look which assured her that he felt the appeal to his donor and that henceforth the country lad was safe from all the temptation tom could have offered him there now i shall give that to mamma to take her pills in it's just what she likes and it pleases her to be thought of said maud surveying his gift with complacency as she put on her things you are a good little soul to remember poor mam said tom with an approving nod well she was so pleased with the grapes you brought her i thought i'd try something and maybe she'd say thank you darling to me too do you think she will whispered maud with the wistful look so often seen on her little plain face see if she don't and to maud's great surprise tom didn't laugh at her project good night dear take care of yourself and keep your muffler round your mouth going over the bridge or you'll be as hoarse as a crowd to-morrow said polly as she kissed her brother who returned it without looking as if he thought it girl's nonsense then the three piled into the sleigh and drove off leave polly nodding on the doorstep maud found the drive altogether too short but was consoled by the promise of a longer one if the sleigh lasted till next saturday 
and when Tom ran up to bid his mother goodbye and give her a hint about Maud's gift, she stayed below to say, at the last minute, in unconscious imitation of Polly, Good night, take care of yourself, my dear. Tom laughed and was about to pinch the much enduring little nose, but as if the words reminded him of something, he gave her a kiss instead, a piece of forbearance which almost took Maud's breath away with surprise and gratification. It was rather a silent drive, for Will obediently kept his muffler up, and Tom fell into a brown study. He was not much given to reflection, but occasionally indulged when something gave him a turn in that direction, and at such times he was as sober and sincere as could be desired. Anyone might have lectured him for an hour, without doing as much good as the little call and the chat that grew out of it, for, though nothing very wise or witty was said, Many things were suggested, and everyone knows that persuasive influences are better than any amount of moralizing. Neither Polly nor Will tried to do anything of the sort, and that was the charm of it. Nobody likes to be talked to, but nobody can resist the eloquence of unconscious preaching. With all his thoughtfulness, Tom was quick to see and feel these things, and was not spoilt enough yet to laugh at them. The sight of Will and Polly's simple affection for one another reminded him of an eclectic duty so pleasantly that he could not forget it. Talking of early days made him wish he could go back and start again, doing better. Grandma's name recalled the tender memory that always did him good, and the thought that Polly trusted her dearest brother to his care stirred up a manful desire to deserve the confidence. Torches wouldn't have drawn a word of all this from him, but it had its effect, for boys don't leave their hearts and consciences behind them when they enter college, and little things of this sort do much to keep off from being damaged by the four years' scrimmage which begins the battle of life for most of them. End of chapter 10 Recorded by Federica, Centallo, Italy, 14th of December 2008